I like it. Okay, guys. Oh, wait. I need my book. What do you need to talk about? <laughs> Stop it. Stop. Really? So what do... We... Go ahead, Christian. <laughs> uh, yes, but sometimes peering inside my brain doesn't bring clarity. Um, but yeah, for sure. What was it? 65? So, yeah, so um, guys, Christian is leading us to question number 65. Um, could you go there with me? Let me say that differently. Yes, you can. Go there with me. In I either, well, maybe in the book. That's okay. Guys, the, the reason that I, I want to take you there, if you will, because the reason that I want to take you there is find number 65. It's the bottom of page 200. Imagine that you're sitting down to the AP test and you flip the page on the AP test and question number 65 is sitting in front of you. Manipulation or computation? That's the first thing you've got to think through. Are the AP authors manipulating me into doing this through manipulation or are they doing are they having me do it through computation and heats of formation the products minus reactants which one's this how do you know it's manipulation you see why we're talking about this so guys look at what they've given you they've given you a string of reactions we are talking about 65 right I'm surprised you're not seeing this. So they've given us a string of reactions. There are three of them there. And then you'll notice that um, they've given us their, and the heats. So they've given us three reactions. And then down below it says, calculate the delta H for what we call the subject reaction. Guys, this is classic manipulation form. Here's a subject reaction. Here are three other reactions that, that somehow or another, we've got to make add up to the other one. So guys, anytime you see uh, an enthalpy problem and it's got a subject reaction and then some collection of other reactions, they want you to do that through manipulation. Do you see that? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, what, so, and I think it was even Christian maybe asked me about that early. Like, wasn't it you last time that said, where, does, where do these numbers come from? So what you'll see if they want you to do it through computation is they'll give you heat of formation data. Um, many times it's in a table. Um, it looks kind of like a smaller retelling of, and I know you can't see this from a distance, but it's a smaller retelling of that table. So they'll give you a table that has compounds and then their heats of formation. That's an indication that they want you to do that through computation rather than manipulation. Say that again. Sure, well, and specifically the numbers that you need are the heats of formation. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's then look at 65. Um, okay, so uh, what did I do? Oh, this is a mess, sorry. I didn't really know how to do this, but let's talk our way through it and see if I can help you make sense of it. So this is our subject reaction, okay? And so if that's our subject reaction, what I did is I start, and so the, the, the equations that are X'd out are the ones that are in the book. I didn't want to completely remove them, but I wanted to show this is not the ones we're using. But here's how to do this. Can you read through the X's okay? So we've got H2, F2, 2HF. So as I look at this, I'm like, okay, I'm going to take this reaction and I'm going to make it fit this as best as possible. And remember, it's two things, size and side. And so the bit that I see that's going to need to be on the right side is the HF. So the HF is over here, the HF is over there. So I'm good by side, but I'm not good by size because this is four and this is two. So I went through and doubled everything, but then notice I also doubled the energy. 
Is that okay? Okay, then when I come down to this next one, again, side and size, and I've got the CF4, the CF4 is on the right side, but it doesn't have, again, the right size, so I doubled everything there and then doubled that value. Then when I came down to this last one, now I've got the C2H4 here, but now I've got a side issue. Um, because it's a product in the reaction, but it's a reactant in the subject reaction. So then I needed to do a side flip, moving that over here, which then changes the sign of this guy. Then at that point, I brought everything down, and at, shoot, and as you start to cancel stuff out, the two H2s dropped out, the two carbons dropped out, and then this feels kind of magical, but because they're the ones giving you the equations, it always works out. We've got um, two F2 and four F2, magically six F2, and then we've got the C2H4, and then we've got the four HF and the two CF4s. So we need to show that this adds up, and because it does add up, then the numbers add up, and we simply add these numbers to get that. Is that okay? Yeah. So guys, that was my best effort at trying to give you context, but also showing the work. So that's what it looks like. Yeah. Oh yeah, good question. So now looking up at this one, we did all the side and side stuff, right? And we brought everything down. And when I brought everything down, there's five O2s over here and there were three O2s over here. So I canceled three of them, but that left two. Is that okay? Santiago, go ahead. How would you simplify it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, so like, for example, when you take the AP test, you have two copies of the test, and one of them is scratch paper. You can write all over that thing. So, frankly... What I would do, and I agree with you, this, this is maybe more than we need to do. I did it like this so you could see all, as Christian said, the thought process. But frankly, if I were doing this on an AP test, this is what I would do. So I would see this and I'd be like, okay, I need to double it. And I would just write times two next to it. And then I'd be like, okay, I need to double this. I'd write times two next to this. And then on this one, I would just flip the arrow and then change the sign. I wouldn't spend the time to go through and completely rewrite these. So if that's what you're thinking, I totally agree with you. Uh, making sure that the, you then also double these numbers and change that sign and then just add them up. Yeah, I think I, that's what I would do on the test. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, I think that's great. What else, y'all? Are we done? Is that okay? Okay, so gang, we're gonna get this in the books and here's what I want you to do while I'm recording your homework scores. And this is not a rhetorical question and there is a right answer. Guys, open up your books to chapter 19. Open your books to chapter 19. Seven eighty five and oh, you guys, I want to get the question though. So, guys, this is the question, and I am going to give you a minute to speak with people around you about this in a moment. But, guys, while we're recording homework, I want you to think about this sort of on your own. Here's the question. What is the most important idea in chapter 19? And there is a right answer. Don't talk. Think about it, and then we'll talk. All right. You're okay. No, 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 no. There, we'll have lots of other opportunities. I do but I also have a short attention span. Okay, so guys, here we go. Chapter 19. Previously, we laid out the question, what is the most important thing, concept, topic in chapter 19? Unlike most of the things in our world now where everything is relative thanks to social media, am I on one today? I'm a little bit on one today. 
Um, guys, there is actually an answer to this question. What is the most important thing in chapter 19? Later in the year, as we keep doing more chapter summary formats, you'll find that one of our chapter formats actually hones in on what's the most important thing. But for now, we're going to talk. So, guys, with the understanding there is a correct answer, that immediately stifles conversation because you realize there's a very real chance you're going to be wrong. But we're going to be wrong, um, unless you're right. So, what's the most important stuff in chapter 19? Yeah, Isaac. No. Um, so, most things don't go to equilibrium, um, but you're, 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 you're not barking up the right tree, but you're in the right forest. <laughs> go ahead. Say it again. Okay, so entropy will be important to this. So while we're talking about it, guys, really briefly just laying some foundation, tell us about what you know about entropy. Okay, that's fair. Um, can anybody give us a brief working definition of entropy? <laughs> My suggestion to you is tune out everything Cole said. Um, but we have, and but this is worth mentioning, and I'm glad you brought it up. Guys, we are not going to do state functions, right? We talked about that in chapter five. Are state functions important? Yes. If Eleanor's dad was here, would he be offended? Yeah. You understand he's a physics prof, right? Yeah. So, okay, yeah, he, he would be like, no, you have to do state functions. It's hugely important, but not the way they write the AP test, so we're good to go. Okay, so, but hold on. So back to entropy. We need a working definition of entropy. Wait, physics or chemistry? Chemistry, it's actually, who's the physics, dad physics professor? Um, shoot, chemistry, all the more reason he'd be offended. So, um, so guys, um, back to entropy. We need a working def. Where did you get your definition? Oh, shoot. <laughs> All right. So I'm praying that you're going to give us a definition for entropy. Either one. Stop right there. Because that's it. That's it. Guys, entropy is simply randomness. And if that means nothing to you, lock this word in your brain. Disorder. Now here's the problem. Some of you just locked disorder into your brain, but you're actually thinking order. And guys, understand that's dangerous. I understand that disorder and order are, are antonyms, but guys, understand that in the context of chemistry, it's got to be disorder. Why do we have to think about disorder rather than order? The signs change. Please hear that. It's got to be disorder. If you start thinking in terms of order, you're going to get all the signs wrong. So it's disorder that matters. You good on that? Okay. So I'm going to actually stop you. That's all we need to know. But that's not the answer. What is the most important thing in chapter 19? So now you're not only in the right forest, but you're... Barking up a sapling of the right tree. There's the tree. Guys, that's it. The most important thing in chapter 19 is spontaneity. This is so important that we are actually going to answer this question. What is the most important thing in chapter 19? And the answer is spontaneity. So now, guys, we got to talk about this. Who gets to decide what the most important thing in chapter 19 is? The people that write the test. Right? It's not us. It's not each other. It is the people that write the test. And so, guys, when you see questions over not just chapter 19, 
excuse me, I'm hiccuping, not just chapter 19, but also chapter 5. Guys, all of chapter 5 is leading into chapter 19, and all of chapter 19 is leading towards spontaneity. So when you see these questions on the AP test, you're even now beginning to get the idea that these questions build, right? It's this, and then it's this, and then it's this, and 3 relies upon 2, and they all fit together. Well, guys, the capstone question in that progression of reasoning is almost always spontaneity. So, guys, here's what we're going to do. We are not going to get done today. If you printed the notes, we are not going to get done with everything today. So here's our goal. Today, our goal is to figure out what spontaneity means, and it's to talk about the terms that we need to know as we think about spontaneity, and then it's going to be to sort out some of the things that make spontaneity difficult to think about. And then, guys, we're going to stop, and then we're going to come back, and so that, that stopping point is actually going to be disorder. When we then begin to talk about disorder, which we call entropy, we are then going to stop, call time out, let that be our day, and then we're going to come back on Monday and we're going to finish this conversation. So, this is going to be terms, this is going to be concepts, and guys, it's critical that you get these terms straight. So I'm going to strongly encourage you to write these things down carefully. Because guys, these terms almost start to feel nitpicky. Because they are. But you got to know them right. So what is the most important concept in chapter 19? Spontaneity. So guys, in order for us to understand this, we need to know what is a spontaneous process. Or in the, in the context of chemistry, our processes are reactions. So what is a spontaneous reaction? So guys, do any of you think of maybe even people as being spontaneous? If you think of somebody as spontaneous, and I don't even... This is a, I, my wife has friends that are spontaneous and they drive me nuts. I won't tell you names, um, but I mean, there. But I don't want to give away your thoughts. I don't want to impose on your thoughts. Do you ever think of people as being spontaneous? What are they like? Well, I was going to say, when I think about spontaneous, yeah. That's I, I like everything you just said there, Chase. Just a second. Um, and I, I want to dig into this a little bit. And I, I love that you, when I think about this, this is what I think. And guys, that's the magic of what we do together, right? Because we're, we're refining our thoughts. Um, but there's also some things to be careful of. And the first one is this. And I don't know if this is what you're thinking. But did you hear what Chase said? Or he said, when I think about spontaneity, I think about a clock. Because the AP authors are going to nail you on this. So please, we're going to talk more about this later, but make sure you're clear on this. When I think about a clock, I think about speed. Like, for example, when we did that, that rate lab where we chewed up the Alka-Seltzer tablets and tried to get them to react faster, I'm picturing you with a stopwatch timing how long a reaction takes. And if that's where your head, or if that's where any of your heads are going, guys, be really careful. Spontaneous doesn't mean fast. Just a second. I, pick, pick, the, pick the transitions better. So, guys, spontaneous doesn't mean fast. You can have a reaction that's spontaneous, and it goes really slow. So please don't confuse spontaneous with fast. Spontaneous is just yes or no. Spontaneous is not about speed. It's about yes or no. So, guys, spontaneous. Keep going. Okay. I like that. Hang on to that. That's good. Isaac, go ahead. The nice part is we'll never know that you said it wrong. But basically what it means is that's it. 
And actually, guys, you're going to find out that that is what I find really annoying about my wife's friends. <laughs> she, these girls do things without external stimulus, which to me is very overstimulating um, because these people come over to our house and it's just like, ah, and they're always moving. And I just want to tie them to a chair and go, stop. Guys, spontaneous people are people that are always doing something, and you don't have to convince them to do something. They don't need an external stimulus. They're doing it on their own, which then, Kaylee, ties back to your idea, right? And guys, foundationally, fundamentally, that's what it means to be spontaneous. And Isaac, I like your word, your words, external stimulus. We may say it this way, though. It's a reaction that occurs without outside intervention. Or Isaac's term, external stimulus. If outside is external and intervention is stimulus, we're saying the same things. So guys, and this is a weird conversation and we're not going to engage in it for too long. But what are processes or reactions that you know to be spontaneous? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so, yeah, the thing that's really interesting is I wanted to get to that, and the minute I asked this question, I'm like, crap, how can I manipulate these guys into saying that? And you just did it for us. Yeah, but here's the thing, that, here, here, here's, here's the thing that's weird. Forgive me, you're wrong. Um, and here's why. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's an important, and that's why I wanted to get us to this because it's counterintuitive. So guys, the gas is turned off, so we're not filling the room with gas. Um, but you understand that if we turn this on, methane, natural gas comes out of the tap, but guys, we can fill this room with methane, but nothing is going to happen, right? We've got all the components we need for disaster. We have methane, we have oxygen. This is a combustion reaction just waiting to happen, right? But what do we have to do to make it happen? We need a sparker, right? You need your gangster gun and you need the striker in order to make this happen. Here's the question. Does that mean that it's not spontaneous? And you said, yes, it's not spontaneous. And the answer is actually, and I, this is spontaneous, so reacting methane with oxygen is spontaneous. So the thing that we've got to understand is that little input of energy that we need to add to get the process started does not discount spontaneity. Um, so the, the thought is not, does it start on its own? It's does it continue on its own? Because once you pass the spark into that, this thing goes bonkers. Correct, exactly, right. So it would continue on its own and it would go and go and go and go and go. Mm, closer, but not, we're going to refine the answer, but not necessarily. We're still going to allow, let's do this. We're going to allow this to be our working definition for spontaneity. But for this definition to work, like maybe in parentheses, we're going to say, but activation energy doesn't make this not true. So if we got to add a little bump to get it to go, but then it goes on its own, that's still spontaneous. So let me give you this then, because I know you're searching for, for what, so we've got CH4 plus O2, and I'm not even going to balance it, but this is the reaction you're talking about, right? Carbon dioxide and water are the products. So we understand that we've got to add a spark in order to get this to start, but once it starts, it goes. So that's spontaneous. So what does not spontaneous look like? The answer is this. It's not spontaneous in the other direction. You can't take carbon dioxide in water and give it a little bump and then it just continually turns water and carbon dioxide back into methane. Can you do this? Yeah, absolutely. We can actually set up reaction vessels where we can turn water and carbon dioxide back into methane. Um, but 
it doesn't happen on its own. We've always got to, and here's the interesting thought, we've always got to be doing work. We've always got to be pushing it. We've always got to be adding energy to get the reaction to go the other way. It's this direction that it happens by itself. It's this direction that it doesn't. And guys, that's an, just a second, Bruce, that's an important idea we're going to talk about in a minute. If a reaction has a direction in which it's spontaneous, the opposite direction is never spontaneous. Which is a deep thought. We'll talk more. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Good. No, that's a yeah, great question, and and it's a very specific question, and it's one that we're going to answer down the road. Um, but the answer is never always and never right but but usually the only reactions that their spontaneity directions change relative to pressure are are reactions where gases are are consumed or formed um so gas phase reactions can be sensitive to pressure changes liquid and liquid aqueous and solid reactions typically that's not the case Sam, are you? Sorry, I didn't mean to. I'm not like throwing stuff at you. I didn't know. Go ahead. Your only question? So if we answer this, we're done? Shoot. This will be great. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's okay. And this is where Isaac was starting to go, where he was in the forest, but not at the right tree. Because I, the thing that you're talking about, it back and forth is equilibrium, right? And so not all react, many, most reactions don't go to equilibrium. Um, most of them go to completion. We call them quantitative. So what's going, and we're jumping ahead, but let's say it and then we'll come back to it. The idea is this, if you have a, a reaction at equilibrium, and it's actually going to be in our notes in just a minute. If you have a reaction that's at equilibrium, it's actually going in the forward and reverse direction at the same time. And we don't consider that, it's weird, we consider it to be spontaneous in both directions simultaneously, but we talk about it a little bit different. Um, we're, so we're, yeah, woo, say that again. Yeah. Right. So, but, and that's where this gets tricky because every reaction that has a direction that it always goes has a direction that it never goes. If you've got a reaction that's going in both directions simultaneously, um, we give that a different term. We're about to talk about reversibility and irreversibility. And this is where the lines get muddled and we're about to go there. And you're going to find out that actually equilibrium is going to pop onto the screen in just a minute and we'll bring it into the conversation. Go ahead, Santiago. Has to be what? Sorry, I missed the... Oh, yes, yes, yes. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. That, that all of, well... Okay, so remember when we looked at those enthalpy of formation numbers and we saw that most of them were negative and that means that they're losing energy? Those things tend to be spontaneous, but we're also going to look at reactions that don't give off heat. They take in heat and they can also be spontaneous. And this is actually the crisis that we're coming to in about 30 minutes. And that's where we're going to stop and then pick it up on Monday. Yeah, you'll see. So guys, this is exactly what today is supposed to look like. This is why you summarize chapter 19 ahead of time. This is why I told you not to look at chapter 19 until we get done with chapter 5, right? Because guys, chapter 19 is a mess. There's a lot of big ideas. There's a lot of very specific terms. There's the potential for a lot of confusion. And this is exactly what today was supposed to look like. I wanted to give us the opportunity to talk through some of these things. I wanted to give us the opportunity to test some ideas and see where they land. Um, but guys, now what we're going to do is we're going to bring all of these ideas together. 
But guys, there's some brilliance going on in this room. That whole conversation about reversibility, right, and equilibrium, very important. Santiago, your idea about what about heat and releasing energy and heats of formation, also very, very important. But guys, the challenge is then to bring these ideas together in reasonable and correct ways. And that's actually what we're going to start on now. So guys, take all of these wonderful ideas that are floating around in your brains and let's start to bring them together a little bit. So guys, the question that I posed to you a second ago is what processes do you know to be spontaneous? We talked about burning gases, but guys, I want to offer you a couple, and this is obviously not an exhaustive list, but it includes some interesting ideas. You don't need to write these down, but the question is this, guys, what characteristic properties make, spon make reactions spontaneous? And Santiago, this is to your point with heats of formation. Guys, reactions that are spontaneous lose energy to their surroundings. That is a nugget that's worth writing down. Guys, reactions that are spontaneous lose energy to their surroundings. Did you notice, Spencer, that number two is your thing? Hydrocarbons burning. So guys, we're going to use these three ideas as sort of our touch points here. But here's the important idea. Losing energy to the surroundings. So let's talk. Let's first of all think about balls rolling downhill. Did you guys all draw this in your four quadrant thing, the ball? Huh? See? All right. So guys, the idea is this. If we've got a hill and if we've got a ball, will that ball ever roll uphill? No. So that is not going to happen. It has a direction that it never goes. But it also has a direction that it always goes. If you let go of that ball, which is kind of like adding a little bit of energy at the beginning, there could be an intervention at first that we have to hold the ball and then let go. Um, but when, as that ball goes, it rolls downhill, what kind of energy is it losing? Potential or kinetic? Potential, right? It's turning into kinetic until it gets to the bottom and then friction, it all bleeds away. But guys, we are losing energy as balls roll downhill. The important connection is this. The ball is rolling downhill all on its own because it's losing energy. Yeah? Okay. So then guys, the next one that we have is actually, can I not go back? is actually this one, the burning of hydrocarbons. Why does methane burn, natural gas burn, all on its own? It's losing energy. In what form? Come on, guys. Why do we light Bunsen burners? It's not to make the room cooler, <laughs> right? Guys, we light Bunsen burners because it's a source of heat, and that's the energy that's being released. We are losing heat to the surrounding system and surroundings. We're losing heat to the surroundings. And so hydrocarbons like natural gas burn all on their own. And the reason it happens all on its own is because it's losing energy. Go ahead. Shoot. That's exactly where this should go. Does that mean that every exothermic reaction will be spontaneous? Frighteningly, the answer is no. And here's why. Guys, that, 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 and this is actually what's the biggest idea in this, in this chapter? Spontaneity. That's what they're going to do to you. They're going to give you this reaction and they're going to go, is this spontaneous? And then they're going to give you the delta H value and it's going to be negative. And you're going to be like, wait, that's negative. That's exothermic. It's probably spontaneous until you find out it's not. Here's guys. And so bottom line is we can't answer the question yet, but I want to get you closer to the answer. Did you hear the brilliant question? Does that mean that every exothermic process is spontaneous? Because that's what we seem to be saying right now, right? Anything that gives off energy tends to happen on its own. Things burning, balls rolling downhill. We'll talk about nails rusting in a minute. All exothermic and they all happen on their own. But the reason that we can't say definitively that exothermic happens on its own is because there's a whole other kind of energy other than heat that we haven't talked about yet. What's that other kind of energy? Entropy. Let's say that again. 
Guys, the other kind of energy that we haven't even brought into this conversation isn't heat, it's entropy. And disorder will also drive reactions in the same way that losing heat does. And we're going to tie those ideas together in the next couple days, but it can also be about disorder. Isaac, I'm going to move forward with this. Um, but guys, let's then talk about nails rusting. Do you guys remember nails rusting, endo or exothermic? Do you remember? We talked about it last year in class. You probably, remember we, we talked about the hot packs, right? Do you remember that? And I even put the, the picture on the screen, or Miss Call did, the picture on the screen with the iron ring tagged to the side of the door. And then there was the picture of a campfire. And we talked about what do these have in common? And the idea was they're both reactions with oxygen. And guys, rusting is, is exothermic. As something rusts, it gives off heat. The problem is, is that it happens so slowly that it's hard to perceive the heat unless you speed it up. And we talked about grinding the iron into a powder. And then if you put it in a packet and hot packs, right? And you break them and oxygen gets in and the iron powder inside there rusts and it gives off so much heat so quickly that it warms your hands. Do you remember when I talked about that? So guys, the idea here is that rusting is very exothermic. It's just also very slow. And so consequently, we're not really aware of the heat that's given off unless we speed it up. And that's how hot packs work. Yeah. No, it was, we actually didn't do a gas unit last year. No, we did it when we talked about reaction rates. We talked about the four things that can speed up reactions, and those were surface area, concentration, catalyst, and temperature. <laughs> Uh, and, um, and we talked about that idea that if we could take that metal and grind it up, then it would actually react fast enough that we could use the heat to warm our hands. So you guys good on these ideas? So, and Josh, this is where we got to be careful, but we're going to come back to your idea. So we're beginning to create this connection. We're beginning to find a pattern or a relationship that says that reactions that give off energy, whether that's kinetic or potential or heat or whatever, reactions or processes that give off energy tend to be spontaneous. Is that okay? Okay, and guys, obviously all of these examples that you see in front of you are examples of that. Are we all settled with the idea? And you know that we're headed to the edge of a cliff, right? Because Josh asked the question, does that mean that all exothermic reactions are spontaneous? And we started to fudge a little bit. Well, guys, now we're going to fudge for sure. What I want to do is I want to show you an exception to this rule. So what we've talked about up until now is that reactions that are spontaneous, and our definition of spontaneous is happens without outside intervention. Reactions that are spontaneous tend to give off heat. They tend to be exothermic. But guys, what I want to do is show you an example of one that violates this rule. And guys, this is not a hot pack. This is a cold pack. Do you guys know how these work? Do you know how to make them work? No? Okay. So you understand this didn't come out of a freezer, right? This is room temperature. So how do these instant cold packs work? And the answer is, you can hear, <laughs> you, you can hear the beads, right? Those are actually beads of ammonium nitrate. Can you picture it? NH4, NO3. What do you know about the solubility of NH4? Always soluble. What do you know about the, the solubility of NO3? Yeah, guys, this stuff is like crazy soluble. That's actually why this works. We'll talk more next time. But so guys, we've got the ammonium nitrate pellets, but then there's also a bag of water inside of here, a bag inside the bag. And what you do is you crush this. And when you do, the, the bladder inside bursts and the ammonium nitrate and the water begin to interact with each other. And the water... Uh, the ammonium nitrate dissolves into the water. And as the ammonium nitrate dissolves into the water, this gets cold. What's our system? In this thing, what's our system? No. The ammonium nitrate and the water. Those are the things that are interacting. So guys, where does that put our bruised arm? 
in the surroundings. So you bruise your arm and you need to take care of that. So you crush this and then guys, you put it on here and it feels cold. That's the point. So if it feels cold and if the system is the ammonium nitrate in the water, is this endo or exothermic? Talk more about that. Was that Chase somebody? Talk, tell us how you know. That's it. And guys, remember, heat is the flow of energy from hot to cold. And so if heat is flowing from my hot arm into the cold bag, the direction of energy transfer is into the system, and that's endothermic. Are you sold on that? Okay. So then, guys, this. Do you have to continue to shake this crazy thing in order to keep it getting colder and colder? The answer is no. The minute you burst this and then give it a shake to mix things together, it just keeps getting cold. So is it spontaneous? Is it spontaneous? Yeah, what's our definition of spontaneous? Happens on its own, but we don't count that initial change, right? So we have to burst it. But the minute that it bursts, as they interact, guys, this just keeps doing its thing until we're out of reactant, which in this case is the ammonium nitrate. And guys, it just keeps getting cold. So two questions. Is this spontaneous? Yes. Are you convinced? You're hesitating. It's spontaneous, but is it endo or exothermic? And... Do you see the violation to the rule? Do you see it? Okay. So guys, this is where things get vague. Because with things like quick cold packs, we have a violation to the overall principle, which Santiago got us thinking about a while ago. Guys, we have a violation of the rule. We have this, this idea that things that happen on their own are exothermic. But now we have a very clear example of something that happens on its own and it's endothermic. The question is, what explains it? What's going on? Go ahead. We're, we're kind of, we're not, I'm, I'm not ready. I love where your head is going. We're not ready to go there yet. We'll go there on Monday. So, guys, I'm, I'm, as, I'm, I'm asking the question, frankly, now at this point, somewhat rhetorically. But I need to know that you understand the tension that we've just created or chapter 19 is going to be lost on you. So here's where we are. We established a principle that says things that are spontaneous tend to lose energy. Now we've got at least one, and there are many more examples of exceptions to this rule. Things that happen on their own, but they appear to be taking in energy. Are you with me there? Because here's the deep thought. This thing is still losing energy. You just don't see it and you can't feel it. And guys, this is where chapter 19 gets weird. This is actually not a violation to the rule. This thing is still losing more energy than it's taking in. The difference is this. Your understanding of energy is too narrow. Up until now, because of chapter 5, your only understanding of energy is heat. And you can feel heat going away, exothermic, it feels hot. You can see energy going away as balls roll downhill. You can see energy going in as this thing feels cold. You can feel that. But guys, it turns out this thing is losing energy. The problem is, is that our understanding of energy is fundamentally too narrow. So guys, what's the energy that we need to also be thinking about? And the answer is disorder, which we call entropy. So let me give you the answer to the question, and then we're going to flesh this out. It kind of comes to your ideas about bonding, but these are actually intermolecular forces, so I didn't want to go there with you. But guys, here's the idea. When we break this, and, when, and what we're about to say is the answer to chapter 19, I'm going to lay it at your feet, and then we're going to spend the next two days coming to understand it. But guys, the idea is this. When you break this, what direction is heat traveling? 
into it. It's endothermic. It feels cold. But guys, it turns out that there is an offsetting release of energy that is greater than the heat that's going in. And that offsetting input of energy is in the form of disorder. As these really pretty ammonium nitrate crystals dissolve into the water, they get disorganized. They get disordered. And as they get disordered, the energy is actually going down as the system bleeds energy in the form of disorder. And guys, that amount of disorder actually offsets the input of heat, and this thing happens spontaneously. Just a second. So fundamentally, guys, and this is, we're going to chase this for days. That's the big idea. We need to wrap our head around the idea that disorder is a driving force in our universe the same way that losing energy in the form of heat is. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. That and, and so there, if you'd like to, there's actually a little aside in chapter 19 where it talks about what are called microstates. Yeah, and you can actually sit down and do the math. And given the number of particles that you have and all the different possible organizations that they can take on, you can figure out the number of microstates. And what, what disorder actually is, when we quantify messed up, uh, what we're really doing is talking about additional microstates. So if your mom comes into your bedroom and says, your bedroom is a mess, you simply say, no, mom, it just has more possible microstates, right? My, my, my shirt could be here or my shirt could be there. When it goes in the hamper, all I'm doing is reducing the number of microstates. So, guys, literally, quite literally, that's what's happening is that when you've got a crystal that's tied together, it doesn't have many options in terms of where it can be. But as this dissolves, these particles particles have more freedom to be in more places and that increases disorder. So they'll never you'll never see on the test microstates but that's actually what it's all about. Is that okay? Okay, so guys, this then is where we are. We literally just talked about the the rest of chapter 19. Now we've got to spend the next 2 days and figure it out. Go ahead. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah, right? Isn't that crazy? It gets even bigger than that. And we're not going to get into it today, but let me repeat this back so that people hear what you said. And I love the way you're thinking because you're going away. Energy is the ability to make a change, right? Um, and if energy is the ability to make a change, then how is disorder the ability to make a change, right? And the answer is, and this is, this is, there's a name for it. It's not part of the curriculum. It's called the entropic principle. And there's a, there's a driving principle in our universe. It's, ex I mean, it, things fall in gravity, right? That's a driving principle in our universe. There's a principle of what we call, there's an entropic principle. And this entropic principle says that every process in our universe is moving towards states of greater and greater disorder. Um, there, there is an unlimited amount of disorder and we're always moving towards more of it. And that moving towards more disorder causes things to happen. So we said that energy is the ability to make a change, right? Well, all of the changes, all of the things that we see happen in our universe are always moving towards systems of greater disorder. Everything that happens always moves towards greater disorder. Do you buy it? Yeah, yeah. Can I give you a really interesting contradiction to that? Life. Right? If you think about it, everything that's living, you and me, you're, for you to be alive, your body needs to have order. The molecules have got to be in the right place at the right time. There's got to be structure to your bones and everything else, unless you're like Chase and you break them. Um, there's got to be, there's got to be structure and order to everything. Life, by definition, is a contradiction to that entropic principle. Because out of the mess that our universe is, oh my gosh, there's life, right? Um, so then the question becomes, how can life exist if it violates this idea that all processes are moving towards greater order or greater disorder? And the answer is actually um, ties back to the sun. 
Um, and so the idea is that where does the energy come from that drives life? Well, then it starts with photosynthesis and carbon and oxygen, making sugars. That, that Anyway, it's a big process. But as this happens, I mean, even if you think about photosynthesis, where carbon dioxide and, and water make sugars, that's violating the entropic principle because carbon dioxide and oxygen are all messed up and they come together as sugars. The energy that drives that's from the sun. And so what's happening is that as the sun drives this process, the sun is becoming more disordered. And so anything that you see happen, even if it's sugars being formed inside of plants, somewhere in the universe, there's another change taking place that increases the disorder over here so that this thing can become more ordered. Yeah, it's a crazy, crazy idea. And we'll talk more about it. Josh, were you, you're scratching your brain. Yeah. Um, disorder. Yeah. Say like the principle, like, so what exactly is like the, the definition of disorder? What is being disordered? Just think about messed up. I mean, you can picture your room when it's cleaned up and you can picture a room when it's messed up. Cleaned up is low entropy. Messed up is high entropy. Um, we're going to get to that in a minute. Well, actually, we're going to get to that Monday. For now, so long as you understand that there's order and disorder, low and high entropy, that's where we need to be right now. We're going to tie it to energy in a bit. Go ahead. Say that again. Which things? Yeah. We're actually... We're going to... And this... This is the danger of what we're doing. We're talking about these things and we're bringing up ideas. We may not get there. Well, you know what? Let's get, uh, let's get there right now. No, 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 no. I wasn't planning on doing... You're going to have to let me come back to this next time when it's in the flow. But it actually... Let's just do this. When an okay, so here we have a salt crystal. Is that in terms of disorder, high or low? It's ordered, but again, we've got to be careful about saying ordered. We're going to say low disorder, okay? So this is a low entropy system. It's low disorder. Um, this is, and as a matter of fact, never mind, that's too much information. So crystals are low disorder. Is that okay? Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to bring in some water molecules. I'm going to kill the volume, but let's bring in these water. Ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water. Water molecules interact with the ions on the surface. It's not dropping out. Okay. Hang on. So these water molecules carrying these ions into the solution. What's happening to disorder? It's going up, right? It's like, whoa, we're free, let's party, and it's making salt water, right? So the idea is that as these these ions, where's my crystal? As these ions are going into solution, the disorder's going up. So what does disorder look like? Disorder, well, it's always relative. So this is what low disorder looks like. This is what higher disorder looks like. We'll always think about it in terms of change. But this is disorder going up. Is that okay? Okay. Are we all right, guys? Go ahead. No, it's the most disordered. At that point, disorders reached a maximum. As compared to the solids that made it up. Yep, absolutely. Are we okay? So guys, let's do this. We've got a couple more minutes left. And what I do want to do is get some terms in your hands that you are going to need to know. So we've skipped through this. So, guys, you don't need to write this down, but let's come back to our transitional thought. So we understand the processes that happen lose energy, but now we know that there are processes that happen spontaneously that appear to not be losing energy. Heat is going in and not coming out. Now, understand, we leaped into the future and we talked about what was really going on. But, guys, the transition is this. The, 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 the rub, the lack of the, the gap, if you will, in our understanding is that our definition of energy is too narrow. Energy is gained and lost through heat. 
But guys, there's another way to gain and lose energy, and that is through the conduit of disorder or entropy. And that's where this is going. So guys, what we need to do in order to have a successful day on Monday is we need to get some terms and definitions in your hands. We're going to do this and then we're going to call it a day. So guys, it goes like this. These are important terms that you need to know. Maddie, this is where we're going to start talking about equilibrium. So guys, these are just terms. Feel free to ask questions, but these are just words that need to become a part of your vocabulary. So guys, reversible processes. This is a process in which it is possible for a system to go back to its original state with no net change in the system or the surroundings. This is what is called a reversible process. That's actually the next bullet. Yeah, yeah, that's equal everyone. So guys, this is actually the example in the book, but I really like it because it's something I can visualize. Chase just said it, and we'll talk in a minute. This is equilibrium. But the problem is, is I can't visualize equilibrium, but I can visualize a refreshing cup of ice water. So guys, next to this, you'll notice that this is not a beaker. Draw the world's saddest cup of ice water, one cube of ice. Now guys, let's put this at zero degrees Celsius. At zero degrees Celsius, does water freeze or does ice melt? The answer is yes. Yeah, both. So now guys do this. You don't need to draw in specifically what a water molecule looks like, but draw a water molecule in your ice cube and then draw a water molecule in your liquid water. Which one has more energy, the liquid or the solid, at, at zero Celsius? The liquid has more energy. It's at the same temperature, but it has more freedom because it's not bound up inside the ice cube. So guys, imagine that your water molecule crashes into the ice cube. What does it do? It gives its energy up to the ice cube. Just like when two cars run into each other, the one that's moving faster gives energy to the one that's moving slower. And so, guys, when this runs into this, the, the liquid molecule gives up its energy to the ice cube. Well, guys, where does that energy go? Well, it goes into one of the molecules that's in the ice cube. So what happens? Well, when this molecule hits the cube, it gives up its energy. It freezes. But that energy goes to one of the molecules that's already in the cube, and it melts. And for every molecule that freezes, another molecule melts, and there's no net change. So freezing and melting are happening at the same time, and that is what we mean by a reversible process. If this stays at zero degrees Celsius, you're never going to know anything's happening. The ice cube's not going to get more massive. It's not going to get less. It's just going to be the same. And guys, this is what we call a reversible process. And as Chase pointed out, we call that equilibrium. Yeah, in theory that there would be some morphing of its shape because it's not perfectly replacing the other, but its mass wouldn't change. So now, guys, the next term, are you good on this idea? Do you like the analogy? I like it too. So, guys, the next term we need to know is an irreversible process. 
So an irreversible process is a process that cannot be undone simply by reversing the events that caused it. Yes. Bingo. The methane. Can we turn carbon dioxide and water back into methane and oxygen? Yeah, but not just by hitting it with a striker. So guys, but don't be confused here. This does not mean that it can't go backwards. Again, just like the methane. Could we take combustion and run it backwards? Yeah. So guys, it doesn't mean these can't go backwards. It just means they can't go backwards through the same process. So what makes the processes different? And the answer is work and heat. You got one more thing to write down, then I'm going to show you the world's worst animation, and then we're done. There isn't even Kathy. And as a matter of fact, the animation is so old that it's no longer supported by any computer on the planet, so I actually had to figure out a way to jerry-rig it. You'll see. Okay, so guys, reversible processes go both directions at the same time, and they, um, it's equilibrium. Now we have this thing called irreversible processes. They have a direction they always go. They have a direction they don't go. This, Maddie, is why I was hesitant at first to talk with you about equilibrium. Here's why. Now, guys, we need to define spontaneous. We have this working definition that says spontaneous means happens on its own without any outside intervention. And guys, that's true. All I did was copy this down again. If you don't want to write it down again, don't. How it, or abbreviate or whatever. But guys, now we need to tie these ideas together. And when we talk about spontaneous processes, they always occur in what we call the spontaneous direction. All spontaneous processes have a direction they always go. Because this is the big idea, and this is again why I was hesitant. Guys, all spontaneous reactions are therefore irreversible. Okay, I want to I tie back to Maddie's thought and then I want to go where you want to go. So Maddie, this, and to all of you, but Maddie, this is why I was hesitant to talk equilibrium with you. Because when we think about a system that is at equilibrium, we don't think about it as being spontaneous in both directions. Um, spontaneous in both directions is a reversible process. It's doing both canceling each other out. But understand, given our definition of spontaneous, when we talk about spontaneous, spontaneous processes are irreversible, which means they have a direction they do go, and they have a direction that they don't go on their own. Reversible goes in both directions on their own, but we don't think of them as being spontaneous. We think of them as being at equilibrium, and they don't mean the same thing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, that very good. So that it's, it's a different classification and not a subset of the other. Yeah. Cade, go ahead. So simply, well, not simply, but the, the, the last thing we talked about is the idea that spontaneous reactions have a direction they always go and they have a direction they never go. And as a result, that makes them irreversible. So balls always roll downhill, they never roll uphill. That would be spontaneous. Um, so anything that has a direction, it always goes on its own, but can't go the other way on its own, that's spontaneous. Guys, can I show you the world's worst animation? And then we're going to call it quits. 
um, it actually goes like this. Ready? The uh, new spontaneous clay ball thing, which actually isn't even a clay ball. These are eggs. So guys, here's the question. If you have eggs in your hand and if you let go of them, what are they going to do? They're going to fall and they are going to smushify every single time. Guys, that means that this is spontaneous. Eggs falling and eggs breaking have a spontaneous direction. This is a spontaneous process. Now, guys, this. Is this reversible? By our definitions, is this reversible? Because if it's reversible, it's at equilibrium. Do eggs ever just spontaneous? You drop an egg and you come back to clean it up and the egg goes, never mind, I got this. And it leaps back into your hand, knit together is the egg. Obviously, no. So guys, this is an irreversible process. It can't go, that egg, you're going to wait a long time before that egg leaps back up into your hand. So guys, you understand reversible and irreversible. So this has a direction that it always goes, the spontaneous direction goes splat, and a direction that it never goes, the irreversible, the, the non-spontaneous direction that it doesn't go. Now, can it be undone? And the answer is yes. Guys, in theory, you could gather up the yolk, you could take the shell, just a moment, knit the shell back together. You could put the oak, the oak, the yolk and the white back inside, knit it back together, and you could turn it back into an egg. But guys, that's going to be a lot of work. Huh? See what? And guys, literally, in the physical sense, it's a lot of work. The idea is that it doesn't take a lot of work to make the egg go, but in order to put the egg back together, it's going to take a lot of work. You ready for the weird thought? And then we're going to go. The net energy change is the same. So guys, the amount of energy that's lost when that egg drops and smushifies is actually equal to the amount of energy that we need to go in in order to turn it back into the pristine eggs. The difference is, is that making it go backwards, more of that energy has to happen through work um, and therefore it doesn't happen on its own. Don't worry about those details other than to understand this. And guys, it literally looks like this. Energy diagrams, right? This is a pristine egg. This is a mess. The egg goes down because energy is being released. But guys, in order to turn the mess back into the egg, the energy change would be the same. It would just require more work because you got to put everything back together. This is where we're going to stop. So guys, what I want you to do is this. Let's go to the homework assignment at the end of the deal. And let's go back here, and let's go here, and then let's go here. Guys, this is the homework assignment. It's also in the slides. I would encourage you to get started on this tonight, but it's not due on Monday because we're breaking up the day. So guys, I'll leave this on the screen. Let's take a break. You know that when we get back, we're just going to dig into writing up our labs. So guys, let's come back after. Oh, can I photo? Um, I know, right? And so guys, take the break that you need. Come back. We'll start writing up labs when you return.